wanted to uh, thank you for your warm welcome and to thank you for being here. Um, elder fraud is my topic and it is a form of crime that's been growing by leaps and bounds. And I was also delighted to see that the title of the conference is kind of a circle of care because in order to prevent fraud upon our elders or anyone else really, but especially the elders, we need to be building a circle of care for our elders. So that's kind of everybody in the community, all the sets of eyes that we can get to protect them. And so what I want to do today is kind of give you the lay of the land, tell you what, what the basic frauds are, generally who's committing them, and how to prevent them, okay? I want you to walk out of here with knowing that you have some tools, knowing that if you don't know what to do, you know who to call which, by the way, is the police, <laughs> but we'll get there. So elder fraud, elder financial abuse uh, is a crime. It's a felony. If you steal more than $950 from an elder, uh, that's, that's a felony. If it's less than that, it's a misdemeanor. But I understand we're, we're talking about prevention here, so let's get going on it. I wanted to give you a couple of stats. There was a really fabulous uh, study done by a guy named Mark Lax that, I think it was 1996. And he did a study of the effects of abuse of all kinds on elders. And just as far as nomenclature goes, I use the term elder and senior independent, uh, you know, interchangeably. I use elder because that's the, that's the word that the law uses. Um, and our elder, elder fraud unit is uh, not only protecting elders, we also protect uh, dependent adults between 18 and 64. So if you're 65 or older and you're being defrauded, then you're covered under the elder provision. So, um, so back to the Mark Locke study. We found that when an elder has suffered abuse uh, of any kind, and usually they're overlapping, so that's physical, emotional, um, financial certainly, we found that elders who have been abused have three times the mortality rate of their peers. And I don't mean three times the mortality rate of everybody else in the population. I mean three times the mortality rate of people who are over 65 who have not been defrauded. There's a number of reasons for that, which we'll get into later. Um, now, I, can, I, I actually talked to him and asked him for financial abuse, which is really the biggest piece of the pie, as far as abuse goes, is financial, does financial abuse provide that three times mortality rate effect as well, all by itself? He, he said he can't make that statement uh, because he was studying abuse of all kinds, but I feel pretty confident in saying, at a minimum, financial abuse heightens the mortality risk for elders. I couldn't give you a number, but it's for sure it heightens it. And why is that? Well, because oftentimes, if an elder's been defrauded, they have their lack of money for medical care. They get depressed, obviously. Um, if their standard of living drops, they might be you know, unable to pay their bills. So it's cold at home. If they're isolated, things get worse. Um, if they're vulnerable due to cognitive deficiencies or simply because they're elderly, they're more likely to fall prey to a scam. And it just kind of gets to be this snowball rolling forward. Um, it's really not good. And so in order to prevent elder fraud, we got to back way up and start early. So let's get going here. OK, we already uh, covered this. But the rehearse part, you're going to do a little rehearsing. And uh, you're going to practice saying no. <laughs> I'm serious. Some of us uh, don't feel comfortable saying no, so today we can get some practice. So I'd like to see a show of hands. Um, how many folks here are professional caretakers? Okay. And how many folks here are here to get more information for their own family members? Okay. Great. Well, uh, I want to give you that information, and we'll have a little time for questions and answers later in case you don't get the information you need. Um, so let's go. Who steals from elders? There's a, I just found a fabulous uh, study yesterday 
Mark Locks participated in the in a study. He was one of like ten uh, researchers who did uh, a study and came down with stats. Who usually defrauds an elder is somebody they know, and this is really should not come as a surprise. I mean, I think in the last twenty years, uh, what with domestic violence, child abuse, all kinds of abuse uh, studies. It's turning out that who's usually going to hurt you is somebody you actually already know. I hate to say that, but we gotta kinda look this thing in the face if we're gonna be able to deal with it. <coughs> Elder fraud contains uh, some overlapping elements uh, with domestic violence. It's something that is usually hugely underreported. Under um, the elder feels a lot of shame, embarrassment, depression. Usually, you know, it's a family secret. So who usually does it? it almost 60% is family. And that usually means an adult child or an adult grandchild. Um, any other family member is kind of in line after that. And caregivers as well. It's anybody, it's usually somebody in the house who's there on a regular basis. It's kind of a crime of opportunity. And the more people there are living with the elder, the higher the risk is. So that's the biggest chunk of that's the biggest chunk of where it comes from. So there are scams that kind of apply to that group, and then there's everybody else. And everybody else is the stuff we hear about a lot in the media. You know, the phone calls. Who's ever heard of the hi grandma phone call? Yeah, <laughs> and you know what it is. Hi grandma, this is your grandson. I'm in jail. Please, 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 please bail me out and don't tell my parents. And I'm in Canada, and I didn't do anything wrong, and I was hitchhiking. Oh, and by the way, here's my attorney. Yes, your grandson is in deep trouble. You know, deep, <laughs> whatever. And uh, this is an urgent matter, and uh, he's in jail. Send us five thousand dollars immediately. Um, and you know, it kind of sounds funny here, but let me tell you, this stuff works, and not just on vulnerable elders. Uh, we get phone scams through Santa Clara County couple of months ago was getting hit hard with guys calling um, from the 202 area code, which is Washington, D.C., saying, hi, this is the IRS. <laughs> we have a warrant for your arrest. Who's heard of the IRS scam? Okay, good. This is great. Um, there's also the you missed jury duty and uh, there's a warrant for your arrest. And there's you uh, committed a traffic uh, moving violation and you didn't pay the ticket and there's a warrant for your arrest. There's always an... <laughs> so anyway, and I found that most of the calls we were getting were actually from people who were under 65, who just didn't know. So it's important to remember that anybody can fall prey to a scam. And uh, it, just because your elder falls prey to a scam does not mean they're cognitively uh, impaired although they might be, it might just be that they don't know. And the current block of elders, uh, you know, there are different strata of uh, elders, as you know, but the eldest among our elders, and I'm going to, when I refer to an elder, I'm usually gonna use the pronoun, uh, the pronoun she, because it's, you know, women live longer than men, so they're just higher in terms of percentage of abuse like this. Um, when you think about it, what's gone on in this country for the last 80 years, there was the women's movement. The whole mad men, you know, the, the elders who are currently in their 80s, they were the mad men generation, you know? And things were really different. The man went off to work and did all the, usually handled the family finances, and the woman stayed at home, and that was kind of her territory. So a lot of the elders, uh, the female elders in particular, are simply, unsophisticated about financial matters. They don't know that the IRS doesn't call you up. Oh, let me tell you, if the IRS wanted to put, had a warrant out for you, they wouldn't call to say, hi, we're on the way to get you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, but, but I gotta tell you, that's hard to think about when you're on the phone and you have that <clears throat> heart-stopping moment, or my, my grandkids in jail, what am I gonna do? Um, so we'll get to that a little bit later, but I wanna tell you the advice I gave my parents uh, when I started this work, was if you ever get a call from me saying, I'm in jail, please bail me out, 
um, just leave me there. <laughs> Seriously. And they said, okay, honey. And so we had to have a talk about that. But seriously, it's not your job, even if it's true, it's not your job to bail out your grandkid. And there's worse things than being in jail. You know, you have a place to sleep, you get fed. <laughs> but don't, be <laughs> anyway, we'll go into this more later. So it turns out, oh, a door-to-door -door scams will take care of that, so let's get going. Of the financial abuse types that are there, uh, according to the 2014 study, which by the way, was it was called uh, the study name is financial exploitation of older adults population based blah blah blah. It's in JGIM, which I think is the Journal of General Internal Medicine. Um, but anyway, it's fairly easy to find. It came out in uh, July of last year. So the most prevalent forms are somebody just steals stuff. So that's jewelry, money. You know, anything, you know, just stolen property, somebody walks off with it. That includes, by the way, hey, Grandma, thanks for the necklace. And Grandma never said it's okay. If you take something without somebody's consent, that's tough. Um, I was talking to a group of real estate agents uh, a while back who had questions about what do we do when an elder's home is up for sale and all the family members start coming in carting off the couch. Oh, well, Grandma wanted me to have this. Well, not if she didn't put it in her will, she didn't. You know, that's theft. Um, so a lot of the informal stuff that families do can really victimize elders a lot. And it's time to get real clear about what that is. Somebody forces or misleads an elder into giving up property or rights. Mostly what we're talking about in this category is stuff like um, Power, elder gives power of attorney to someone who then, excuse me, who then abuses it. There are changes in wills, trusts, investments, because an elder got talked into it. By the way, a couple of distinctions. There is civil elder fraud and criminal elder fraud. Criminal elder fraud is you take something without permission, uh, or somebody lies to you, lies to an elder uh, in order to obtain money, or somebody takes from an elder who doesn't have the capacity to understand uh, what it is they're consenting to. Those are all criminal thefts. Civil theft covers areas, covers those areas plus one that's called undue influence. Undue influence um, unfortunately cannot be prosecuted and it happens in families a lot. What I mean by, excuse me, undue influence is somebody will, close to the elder, will start to isolate them slowly and start feeding them stuff like, it's too bad your family, none of the other members of the family come and visit you. You know, I'm the only one who loves you, and I really love you a lot. Here, have some more cake. No, you know, nobody's called in a long time. I don't know what the problem is. I'm so glad I get to be here for you. You know, I just haven't been able to pay my bills lately. How about, you know, how about you start, you know, it, it, it just builds and builds and builds over time so that by the time the rest of the family or the family at all wakes up and understands that there's something wrong going on, grandma's convinced nobody loves her. Uh, she doesn't know where her money is. Um, so that, that interaction is undue influence. So that's something you, can t you need to talk to a civil attorney about. Okay, next one, somebody impersonated grandma. Oh, by the way, these categories are overlapping. For example, in category number one, if you steal somebody's credit card, you, you can use it. You can drop down to number four, that's impersonating an elder. If you use it without their permission, and you rent, you know, you max out their accounts. And the bottom one is people living off of elders. Excuse me, the next bottom one. That's the relative who's in the house sponging off grandma. And we used to call it sponging off a grandma. <laughs> now we call it a crime. Because if you're not paying rent and the elder is, you know, kind of 
forced one way or the other to pay your bills for you, that's great. Let's see, and uh, the bottom and most heartbreaking one is an elder being just absolutely destitute and nobody in the family caring, or nobody else caring either. So, um, so that's the lay of the land for the largest bunch of folks. Here's what you want to look for in your own elders and those that you care for. And these signs can happen whether somebody has cognitive impairment or not. All right, plenty of elders. Okay, thank God for online banking. That's what I do, because I can never keep track of my checkbook and stuff. So, at least with online banking, I can get to the information real quick. So, but an elder doesn't know where their money's at, or who has access to it, or even how much money they have. That's a problem. Um, if they're doing multiple cash withdrawals that are like norm outside the normal range of what they do, like a lot of times we'll see cases come through the office where an elder has gone to the same bank for 30 years, uh, once a week, taking out $200, you know, and spending it where, you know, going on little shopping trips and stuff, and suddenly, boom, it's up to $1,000 a week, or $1,000 every couple of days. Um, is an elder suddenly happy because they think they've won a whole lot of money? That's like one of the biggest red flags out there because of sweepstakes scammers. If your elder does not know what's going on with their finances, and uh, they either need to get their own credit report, or if they allow you to do it, you can get their credit report. It will require that you have their permission to use their social security number, because that's where you, that's when you call up you know, the credit reporting agencies to get a report. And you'll look through it and see if there are any open accounts that grandma doesn't know about. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, something I love that Cal uh, Santa Clara County does, every time there's a change to a title in a piece of property in our county, a letter goes out to the property owner. How cool is that? So if you don't know that your grandson is busy stealing your house, <laughs> that's how you can find out. If the elder, the mail can be a really interesting uh, symptom. If mail is, if they're either not getting enough mail, for example, their bank statements have been diverted to another address, uh, family invitations, they're not getting family invitations, um, they're not getting most stuff that they should get, that's a big red flag. Also having way too much mail. I mean, piles of mail from different, <laughs> from different scammers doing different, different scams. The details are different, but it's always send us a little bit of money and we'll send you a big pile of money. We'll get into that in a little bit. And somebody is gonna give me a heads up at the halfway mark. Thank you. Okay. Isolation is one of the biggest factors uh, in elder fraud because an elder who is being isolated knows they're vulnerable and has no one to talk to, no way to ask for help. If you call up, you know, if you if you call up your elder and some she starts not being able to come to the phone, like ever, she's always sleeping or at the market or out at a doctor appointment or having a cup of tea in the backyard and doesn't want to come to the phone. If she doesn't come to the phone, that's the time to go by and say, hi, how you doing? If an elder suddenly kind of withdraws into their shell, because they're depressed, you know, are they depressed? Are they afraid? This kind of, see, a lot of elders, a lot of elders who are victims, they kind of know they're being victimized. And one of the reasons this is so un underreported is because it's usually somebody they love and care about. That person that they love and care about might be the last person who this elder has in the world, everybody else having died or moved away so far that she can't get to them. It's just, I mean, and think about how that might feel if your own kid, you find out that your own kid starts stealing from you. It, and, it, it's just a horrific thing. Um, it does a lot to elders, so keep an eye on them. 
So let's see, getting started on the solution. Okay, we talked a little bit about this. If you suspect that your elder is, now, now if it's a family member or somebody that the elder knows, they're not, the elder's not gonna wanna rat them out. Um, use a term of word. Elder's probably not gonna wanna talk about it. Elder probably just wants the problem to go away. You know, it's wants peace in the family. And you know, holidays coming up, they probably don't want family fights at the dinner table. Um, so, and the elder might be kind of defensive about, you know, inquiries into their finances because they're also afraid of losing their independence. They're afraid that if, and I think rightly so, they're afraid that if they, uh, if somebody finds out that they don't know what's going on with their finances, that the family might swoop in and carry them off to a care facility where she'll have no privacy and everybody else is going to start running her life. That's a realistic fear. So you can, if you want to have the conversation, I recommend just having lunch with her and ask some open-ended questions. Gee, I notice you're getting a lot of mail. How, how is that? I mean, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> is this something you like? How are you doing? Looks like, you know, I went, I, I saw a bill from Chase Bank. And I guess you have a Chase Bank account. How's that working for you? Okay, that kind of stuff. You don't want to go in and go, what'd you do now? <laughs> which elders can, you know, which can happen. Or at least the, and the elder can interpret it that way pretty easily. It's such a private matter to all of us. But if we're elderly, it's even more private. Um, the one I would generally use, if there's somebody that the senior trusts who's not in the family, maybe it's a lawyer, you know, the lawyer who, I don't know, did their will 15, 20 years ago, or an accountant that they know, or, you know, a, a trusted friend that they've had for 45 years. Have that person have the talk with the elder to just kind of defuse the situation and see what they can find out. Because an elder might disclose to somebody who cares about them who's outside of the family. Um, there's also, you know, if the elder's willing to let you in on their finances, you can kind of do a shared financial management thing, take her to lunch, say, hey, you know, actually, I was uh, up visiting my folks last year, and mom wanted me to look at their, fi look at their checking account, so I kind of went through it, and everything was fine. And it kind of put her mind at ease to know that I had looked at it, and it's fine. You can do that kind of stuff with your elder, but be aware that in about two more slides, I'm going to warn you about people who want to do that. <laughs> so, so there are some parameters, okay? Um, and we'll get, and I promise you, we're getting there. Ooh. Whoops. I heard the ooh. Um, let's see. So, like I mentioned earlier, power of attorney abuse is a really common way that somebody steals from an elder. Oh, and by the way, um, in your book, this is a diff I just finished this presentation like yesterday at about four o'clock. So if it looks different than the one that's in your packet, it's not you. I changed it. I changed it. Okay. And I and uh, Ms. Martinez has a copy of this. And if you want a copy of the updated one. It's hers to you do with as she likes. So anyway, uh, what a power of attorney is, is really simple. It's, you know, if I go into the hospital because I need hip surgery or something, and I know that I'm probably not going to be mobile for a couple of months, uh, I would designate somebody to pay my bills for me. Um, and in order to do that, I would need to give them a financial power of attorney. And what, that's just, it, and, and the person I give it to acts as my agent. And what they are empowered to do is to pay my bills for me, period. Uh, or anything else I check off, you know, if I say that they can, this is a piece of paper, by the way, you check off what it is you're empowering somebody to do. It can be do financial transactions of any kind, including real estate transactions, opening and closing accounts, I mean, there's a whole list, but you, it's real clear what it is you're giving them the power to do, and they have to act in your interest. They have to, like the one I, somebody, my power of attorney has a fiduciary responsibility to me to act for my benefit. Plenty of people think this is a license to steal. 
It is not. Plenty of people think that the, uh, having somebody's power of attorney makes them immune to criminal prosecution or civil prosecution. It doesn't. You know, if the same thing goes for joint che checking accounts, by the way. If, if a kid, if a, a daughter or son talks mom into putting them on the elder's account, checking account, and all the money in that account is the elders. Well, the kid has access to it. The bank has to honor the checks written by the, the son or daughter. But that doesn't mean the money is still the elders. The son or daughter cannot then go out and spend all of grandma's money. It's not theirs. And we prosecute those all the time. Um, let's see. So unfortunately, we see a lot of power of attorney cases. And we love, we well, love. The great thing about a power of attorney case is if we get a copy of the power of attorney, it actually helps us, uh, while a power of attorney is a civil document, the fact that the, that the uh, suspect signed it and said, yes, I understand, I have a fiduciary responsibility, it helps us prove what's called specific intent for the crime, that they intended to steal. Because we have a piece of paper signed by both of them saying, I'm not supposed to steal. So, um, okay. And by the way, um, this is one of those in the home things. Uh, just because powers of attorney usually have a provision in them that the most current document cancels out any former document. And the way you put it into play, like for example, if I gave my power of attorney to somebody, let's say uh, Pam, then Pam could take that, or I could take that signed document, which has to be, it's, it has to either be notarized or witnessed by two people to be binding in California. But I or Pam could take it over to the bank and say, here's my power of attorney, here's my ID, and uh, I want to make a withdrawal from Janet's account. But that's how you put it into play. You or the a person acting as your agent takes it to different financial institutions and establishes that they have access to the account. So when you, you can revoke the power of attorney, if you find out that somebody is stealing from your elder or from you, you can revoke it. And you revoke it in the same way you established it. You say, okay, I'm revoking my power of attorney. You probably want to do this with, with an attorney advising you but I'm just telling you the mechanics of it, you can revoke a power of attorney, which then has to get, you know, shopped around to all your financial institutions so that they know to no longer give this person access to your account. Um, yeah, so that's power of attorney. We're gonna talk about, <coughs> here's my, how to prevent it. Um, here's how to prevent a power of attorney abuse. <coughs> you have a family meeting. And I mean everybody who you, everybody in your family who has an interest in this, and usually that's everybody. So you also want to have a, somebody who is a long time friend. I'm talking to you as if you're the person who is going to give your power of attorney to somebody else, just for illustration purposes. So have somebody there who is also a dear friend of yours, who you've known for years and years and years to just kind of give you some support, because <laughs> I'm aware that conversations about particularly finances, particularly with family, are highly charged. Um, if there's family dysfunction, that's where it surfaces. And so I, you know, you want to have a buddy there who's, who's outside of the family interplay. So you designate somebody to be your agent. And by the way, this, this, these agreements are all being written down. So if I want to give my power of attorney to my brother Bob, okay, Bob, will you be my power of attorney? Financial power of attorney. And Bob says yes or no. You know, whoever it is can turn it down. And then you say, okay, Bob, uh, thank you. And I will pay you for, uh, you know, you want to, if somebody is actively really running a, doing a fairly substantial role in your finances, you want to pay them. Uh, figure out if, if you want to pay them per transaction or a certain stipend per month. Because if you don't, they'll start paying themselves. Um, and, they, 
and it usually doesn't start out that way, but let's face it, you've been somebody's power of attorney and running their finances for 10 years, and it's a big mess, and you're always having to go to the bank. I'm not saying it's okay, but resentments build, and it, sometimes it will provide an excuse for a suspect to start stealing. And I say excuse, not explanation, it's not okay, it's still theft. Oh. So, the, uh, so Bob has to accept, and I, and I, this is all being written down, and I say, okay, uh, Bob, if you are my power of attorney, I will pay you, and X, blah, 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 how many dollars, and uh, you have to agree to provide everybody at this table with a monthly accounting of what you're doing with my finances. And then, or just two people, you know, this, you know, Pam and somebody else, provide them with a monthly statement of what you're doing with my finances. So that way, there's lots of eyeballs on transactions. There's no misunderstandings because this is all being written down and signed off on. So going forward, you know that whatever Bob does, if you don't find out about it, somebody else will. And if the people, if suddenly Bob's reports start dropping off for getting sporadic or not happening at all, big red flag, you want to catch this stuff as early as possible. Now here's who not to give your power of attorney to. <laughs> okay? Seriously. Anybody with drug, alcohol, or gambling problems. I get that it's an illness, you know, and it's uh, deeply you know, disturbing thing, but it's not your problem. You don't have to allow access to your finances just because somebody has a gambling issue and aren't they down on their luck and too bad. No, you don't, they, if they've proven irresponsible with their own money, they're not gonna be responsible with yours. So we, we, you know, I don't know, I guess we all know somebody in our lives at one point or another who just has never been able to get it together. Has been couch surfing their whole life, uh, just irresponsible with money, just can't seem to get it together. Um, not them. Really not them. They might be lovely, lovely people, but if they're not financially and fiscally responsible, don't give them the power to run your finances. Now there are people who um, actually, <laughs> I, can I have a, does somebody want to be my volunteer? Will you be my volunteer? Excellent. Thank you. Let's just give you a hand. Mark Rodden, thank you. Okay, Mark, your job is to say no. That's it. Uh, and I want, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And um, I want you to say no or, or something like it. If you don't want to say no, uh, you can say, eh, I, I don't really want to do that, or I have, you know, whatever it is you want to come up with, but it has to mean no, okay? All right. So let's pretend that I'm your niece, and uh, I haven't seen you in a long time, okay? So, uh, <coughs> Uncle Mark, it's so good to <laughs> see you. How are you? I'm so glad, you know? It seems like forever since I went away to college, and I, uh, you know, I've learned so much, and I can't wait to tell you all about it. You know, and I was thinking, uh, I did take a course in uh, accounting and financial planning and stuff, and I was hoping that I could help you with that. Because, you know, there's so much stuff out there uh, these days that, that can be kind of confusing, and I'd like to help you with that if you let me. Can, can, will you let me do that? You know, Uncle uh, Mark, a lot of people think that, but you'd be surprised at how much, you know, what with online banking and, you know, all kinds of different investments you can do. A lot of people think they've really got it, uh, you know, pretty well handled when they're missing out on opportunities that they could have. And I really, you know, I think it's, oops, sorry. <laughs> and it's been so long since I've seen you and I just really want to build our relationship. Please, please. Well, you know, I've actually taken some classes <laughs> okay. All right. Well, and I'm not kidding you. This really, this stuff really happens. Well, you know, Uncle Mark, I, I know that. And you know, when Mom passed, she 
she really wanted us to be closer and she wanted me to she wanted us to be closer and I was just thinking that this would be a way that we could build our relationship and I could really honor <laughs> He's good. <laughs> Actually, well, I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I thank you so much. Um, anybody who's leaning on you to give them your power of attorney, that's a red flag. You know. Now this is different than you know siblings getting together and saying, you know, hey mom. Looks like thing, you know. It looks like you might need some help. We want to help you, and this—that's kind of an open conversation with multiple parties who are trusted by the elder. But when somebody's leaning on you, or they get resentful, like if I was given my brother Bob uh, my power of attorney, and he goes, "Well, I don't want to give you my power," or "Don't you trust me?" I feel like you don't trust me. <laughs> he just took himself out of the running <laughs> because. If you encounter defensiveness, on some, it's all about them. And if you encounter defensiveness or pushback about the idea of, of you holding your power of attorney accountable, not them. Go looking for somebody else. Um, because somebody who's going to push back like that, their first, you know, here's the response I, look, I would be looking for. When asked, if I was asked to be, actually I'm my dad's power of attorney, um, and if asked for accountability, I say, I'm so glad you asked. I want you to know you can trust me. It's an honor that I do, that I get to do this for you. And I get that I'm doing something on your behalf, and I'm glad to show you everything. I'm glad to bind myself to whatever agreements you want. That's the response you're looking for. Oh, and by the way, don't have this conversation on Thanksgiving, <laughs> or Christmas Day, or uh, you, you know during Hanukkah, or whatever whatever you know kind of emotionally laden days that you have with your family. Not the parents' anniversary dinner. Certainly not if you've been drinking wine at dinner. Okay, um, <laughs> just make, have a brunch or a lunch or a little barbecue. But definitely before anybody starts drinking. Um, yeah. I'm going to jump ahead of myself for you. These are difficult talks to have. You don't have to have them all at once. You can kind of front load saying, hey, everybody. Actually, you know, the holidays are coming up. You can have this conversation during the holidays, but not on the holiday. Because the holiday is really highly charged. So maybe the day after Christmas. Hey guys, I've been thinking about X, Y, and Z, and maybe you know it's time to give you my give some. I want to give somebody my power of attorney, and so let's have a chat about that. You know, um, and if anybody comes to you, could you stand up again, Uncle Mark? Okay, so let's say we have a thank you, thank you. So let's say we have a. Um, I feel suddenly very <laughs> calm. So let's say we have a lunch set up for tomorrow, and I've told the family, you know, I want to have this discussion just as a fail-safe in case I, you know, have to go in the hospital. I want to give somebody a power of attorney. And then Mark comes to me later in the day, or no, I, no, I'm going to go to him. He's right. He's giving me his power of attorney, or I want him to. I go to him later, and I go, you know, Bob and Sam, they really, they say really lousy things about you. And they've just lousy with money. I wouldn't trust a father to make so. Okay, I just dealt myself out of the deck. The reason being, if somebody can't say it in an open family meeting, uh, you don't want them dealing with you. You know, you don't want this kind of stuff going on. Thank you so much. You're such a sport. Okay. So lock down the lock down the financial issues now. If you have an elder who's uh, who you know, is starting to get a little waffly on money, but they're still able to consent. That is to say, freely, voluntarily. Uh, yeah, in a, you don't want an elder to not know what they're doing. So if they know what they're doing, you can start that conversation with them, get everything written down, and for crying out loud, 
this is the time, if you have a history, of, if there's some grievance in the family or some division in the family that's been going on for years, starting with mom liked you better, you, you know, when we were in kindergarten, do what you can to settle them now, because it gets ugly later on. It just, it can get really ugly. So do that healing now, if you can. To the degree that you can, get it done. Uh, see to it that your elders don't get isolated by anybody. Hmm. And by the way, if you call and it's a situation where grandma just kind of can't ever come to the phone, call up the cops and ask them for a welfare check. Tell them your concerns, you know? I used to get a call from mom every day. I never talked to her anymore, and when I call the house, the caretaker answers the phone, or my brother, my, you know, my dope-smoking brother answers the phone, and I can never talk to mom, and I'm worried about her. The cops will go out and do a knock and talk at grandma's house and make sure everything's okay, all right? Don't be afraid to do this. Um, you need, you, it might be a really good idea if you have a law enforcement officer who's got a sidearm going to the house before you do. I'm just saying, okay? All right. Okay, theft by everybody else. Scammers uh, have a, a information, it's frighteningly available, how much information is out there about us. Uh, there are information sites, there should be a printout in your uh, handout, but we'll get there. Mail theft, pretty low tech, people stealing right out of mailboxes. Door to door scams, you know, the two very nicely dressed young men, work boots, orange uh, jacket with reflective tape. Hey, we're doing so, we're on a roof down, down the street. I see you need a few shingles replaced, we can give you a deal on it. Never hire off a Craigslist, never hire off your front door. In fact, my advice to seniors who are living alone, don't even open the door. <laughs> Seriously, unless you know, you, you know, you know who's on the other side. I don't care who they say they are. Don't, yeah, we'll get there. Anyway, <laughs> so this is a printout of a, of a data search I did some time ago. This is a, a perfectly legal service. There's a whole bunch of them. And they, it's a place that collects data on people of lots of kinds and they will sell it to you for a certain price. So for example, this one, uh, on the left side, if I want to pay, I did a search for uh, residences that are uh, worth between something like four and $500,000, homeowners, mind you, uh, within a 20 mile radius of my office. And they came back with, top right side, there are 11,000 residences that fit that description. And on the left, if I want to pay $1,110.60, they'll give me name, phone number, address, city, state, zip, metro area, housing information, and the carrier route for 11,000 residences. Oh, but that middle category, look at that. If I pay 50 bucks more, They'll give me all that information plus the income level, the head of household indicator, housing information, mail order history, uh, donor type, that means who, who they donate to, whether they're a cat or dog owner, whether there's a grandparent in the household, whether there's a veteran present, seriously, and uh, whether, it's a fee, whether it's a male or female who lives there. Now think about what, this is, this, you can buy this information and it's legal. So promise me you won't, let's put together a scam. So uh, somebody name a charity. Alzheimer's.org. Okay, perfect. All right, and somebody just give me a name. I'm sorry? Bubba. Thank you. I like the Bubba. Okay. And so I'm the scammer. I bought this information. Bubba lives uh, on Heading Street and in San Jose. So I'm the scammer. I have the phone number. I have the name of the person who lives there. And I call it Bubba. Bubba, how are you doing? Great, great, whatever. Uh, you know, I, I, I also, uh, you know, I see that you've been, uh, this is so-and-so from the Alzheimer's uh, Association. Um, we actually are um, doing a fund drive 
to protect our vulnerable elders, and um, we're asking for tax-deductible contributions. Uh, the $500 level or more will get you the, you know, executive donor designation, blah, 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 because we really need to help our elders. Won't you agree to donate? Now, this person knows my name, has my phone number, calls me Bubba, uh, I, I own my own home, and he knows I'm donated to Alzheimer's. For heaven's sakes, that's a piece of cake. So do not assume that just when you get a phone call, just because you get a phone call, that somebody is legitimate. Um, and this is another thing that's really shifted in the last 30 years. Our elders don't know this. They assume they, they extend goodwill. You know, they assume that, you know, why would somebody lie to them? They pick up the phone. Somebody says who they say they are. Why would you doubt them? So my advice is, if you get a phone call or your elder gets a phone call from somebody who they don't know, assume it's a scam. Seriously, just assume it's a scam. Um, even better, even better, oh yeah, oh, and this, is all, this also applies to you've won a bazillion dollars, um, but you have to send us a little bit of money to get your prize. If it comes, okay, let me back up a second. You and your elders need to get uh, telephones that are hooked up to answering machines that let you screen your phone calls. I never answer my, I never answer my landline. It rings constantly. And usually there's nobody there. Usually it's robocalls. Um, and I never pick it up unless I can hear who's calling and I recognize their voice. Everybody should be doing this because the second you pick up a phone, even if you don't start talking, the computer on the other end of the robocall knows somebody's home and, and will just, it will increase the number of phone calls you get. The same thing goes for mail scamming. You know, you've won, I don't know, $500,000 worth of cheese plates or something. <laughs> I mean, it can be anything, but send us $10.95 and you'll get your monthly cheese plate, you know, delivered to your home for the rest of your life. Don't do it, because even though the $10.95 might not mean very much to you, they sell the information, they sell your contact information to other scammers who are suddenly going to start sending you all kinds of special offers for aluminum siding and cheese plates and, you know, museum ready, museum quality moose heads to hang on your wall or whatever it is. That's one of the reasons why overflowing mail is a big red flag for elders. They've some, at some point they opened up some of the mail and they sent money to somebody. Um, and once an elder gets hooked into, oh, and the sweepstakes scammers, you know, it's always send us a little bit of money and, you know, you'll have your $500,000 check there next week. Then a few days before the check is supposed to arrive, you know what, uh, there's been a little bit of a hang up. We need a little more money for attorney's fees. Uh, that would be $300 and then we'll be right there. And by the way, did you want this to be a private presentation or would you like the cameras to be there? when you get your $500,000 check. Well, okay, so $300. And then before, it, it just keeps building and building and building. Um, we had a problem with an elder who uh, was convinced that there was a plane on the runway in South Africa loaded with diamonds and platinum and gold. I was gonna fly to Switzerland and he was home free. Because he had been drawn, you know, at some point the hook just gets in there really deep and it's almost impossible to get it back out. Um, though sweepstakes down, yeah, so let's say you shut, you know, okay, so you put an answering machine on grandma's phone or you've even disconnected the line. Scammers, they do know where your grandma lives, they will send a taxi over to your grandma's house to deliver the cell phone that grandma can use to call the scammers back. And they, then, the, the, then the, so they make contact, they tell grandma, okay, go to the bank, withdraw $500 and send it to us. They send a taxi to grandma's house, drive to grandma's bank, 
Grandma walks in the bank with draw. You see, it builds and builds and builds. These guys are brazen beyond words. Um, and they do tell the family, they do tell the elders that, you know, that the reason the family uh, cut, you know, disconnected the landline is because they don't want the elders to be happy. They don't want good things for the elder. This is another reason to foster your relationships with your elders as they grow older. Because they won't, you know, they won't be as vulnerable to this kind of stuff. We already covered this. Scare and scam. Hi. Warrant for your arrest. Grandkid in jail. Blah, blah, blah. You missed your duty. If you don't answer the phone, they won't call you back. Uh, but if you do answer the phone, you know, understand nobody's going to put a, a warrant for your arrest and then tell you ahead of time that they're coming to get you. But I just want to point out, you can uh, have some fun with scammers. Uh, <laughs> I was on the phone with a scammer. Well, okay, I won't go there. But you can have some fun with some scammers. If there's a, you can start, you know, blah, 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 arrest warrant. Just start reading the phone book. Anybody have a phone book? Just start reading the phone book. Or if there's a particular bothersome medical condition that you have, you know, start telling them about that and, oh, just go into great detail. I guarantee you they'll hang up on you and they won't call back. Okay? Uh, you know, or an air horn. Or a loud whistle right in their ear. If you have 12 grandchildren about two years old when they're just starting to talk, hand the phone to them. You know, you don't have to be sitting there feeling afraid of who's going to call. We have to go after these fools, and, and if you can have some fun doing it, well, I support that. Okay, so teach your elders all this stuff. Keep your eye on the finances. Tell you know, go talk. If you if grandma's making multiple cash withdrawals, go talk to the bank employees and remind them that they are mandated reporters for elder financial abuse. They are. Uh, and so call Adult Protective Services. You can call them. Um, get welfare checks done. We already talked about a lot of this stuff. And at the end of the day, if you may have, you know, if your elder has really lost capacity and is saying yes to everybody who calls, you're going to have to look into conserving them. Um, okay, we already covered this. Have some fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've actually called, covered a lot of this. If, if, you know, if there's anything out of the ordinary, mood changes, weight changes, financial changes, depression, lack of communication, these are all red flags. Suspected abuser usually, okay, we already went through that too. Hostile, wants to isolate the elder. Substance abuse or gambling problems. Oh, see, offers to help with finances. You just gotta be careful with that. Um, caretaker licenses, don't ever hire off of Craigslist. Uh, beware of caretaking agencies that say they're licensed, because plenty of them, and what that means is not they've got a caregiving license from the state of California and have been screened and background checked. No, it means they went down to the city of San Jose, bought a business license for $20. So beware of, you know, find out what kind of license it is. Um, Talk to friends of the elder, people she trusts, let them know your concerns, find out what they know, and call the cops. That's it.